No one escapes when freedom fails, the best men rot in filthy jails, and those who cry to peace appease are hanged by those they tried to please. Unknown. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. Today, President Obama continued his economic tour of America's heartland, stopping in Ohio to visit a family who had been saved by the stimulus. The president assured Americans that slowly but surely, we're moving in the right direction. But what do Americans really think about the economy? Well, according to a new AP poll, 56% of Americans disapprove of the president's performance on the economy. Meanwhile, 61% think the economy has gotten worse or stayed the same under Obama's one. It's unconstitutional because it takes property from banks that did well and compensates the government for the money it loaned to banks and other corporations that did not do well. of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. This is the microchip that could one day be implanted under the skin of every single American. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. Top CFR Lieutenant Diane Sawyer for eight minutes sat there in a sickening fashion with this poor, pathetic family as they discussed how they were all taking microchips because they believed in America and wanted to stop the terrorist. Ladies and gentlemen, this is something out of a science fiction horror movie. They're taking chips because they stand with the mother government. I'm living in Nazi Germany Twilight Zone. Now politicians are announcing that they want to get chipped.
Dear President Obama, we, the people, have stated resolutely we reject your vision for our country. You claim you have not heard us. We, the people, have assembled across America resisting your efforts to subvert our Constitution and undermine our liberty. You claim you have not seen us. Since you have not acknowledged our message, let us here present it once more. For if, as President Wilson said, a leader's ear must ring with the voices of the people, the time has come. Our greatest treasure is freedom, the absence of restraints on our ability to think and to act. The corollary of freedom is individual responsibility. We believe in the power of the individual. On June 28, 2006, Senator Barack Obama gave a speech to the Call to Renewal Conference, where he explained why he finds it so difficult for America to use the Bible to help guide our public policy. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. Folks haven't been reading their Bible. Senator Obama, after you so arrogantly mocked and ridiculed the books of Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and the Sermon on the Mount, taking those passages of the Bible so painfully out of context, you then condescendingly stated that, quote, folks haven't been reading their Bible, unquote, as if the American people don't know what's in there. The real question is, do you know what's in there, Senator? For instance, did you not know that most Christians and historians agree that the Sermon on the Mount contains the most spiritually inspiring words ever uttered by Jesus Christ? But here's the bottom line. You need to go out and you need to look with your own eyes what's going on. The business is closing around you, the empty storefronts, the empty homes, the demolished homes, the number of homeless out there. It's a very scary situation. The hallmark of the fascist economy is that profits are kept private. If you make a lot of money, you're willing to share a little bit of it with politicians, you get to keep it. Losses are socialized. That's what all these bailouts are all about, all the TARP, all these other little acronyms they're using. They're basically taking all the bad deals that Wall Street and the banks and the investment companies and the real estate companies, all those bad deals they made, they're dumping them on you, the American taxpayer and they're driving you into poverty doing it. They're keeping the goodies for themselves, bonuses, huge amounts of money. They're having a really, really good time and they're making you pay for it. They're forcing you to buy the bad assets from the banks and mortgage companies collectively. It's all about taking money from the poor and giving it to the rich. That's what they're doing right now. And it's going to start coming apart because the only way they can keep it going is they're printing up the money. Somewhere down the road, you, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren are going to suffer a lifetime of indebted servitude to pay it all back. That's the plan. That's, that's what allows them to sort of do bookkeeping tricks to say they're not really inflating the money supply because it's a loan on behalf of the people. And you're seeing it at the supermarket and at the gas pump because here's the bottom line. We gave our manufacturing away. We gave our agriculture away. We used to be the breadbasket to the world. We grew so much food we could waste half of it and still have tons and tons to sell to other countries. We don't do that anymore. Now they're trying to carbon tax you for global warming. It's one scam after the other, after the other, after the other. And the question I have is why are you not furious? Why are you not angry? How many more lies must you be told? to understand the reality of life in the United States of America. How many of your sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and husbands and wives have to come back in those cheap aluminum boxes covered with a cheap American flag made in China before you realize the true nature of life in the United States of America? How many more photographs of American soldiers guarding and protecting opium poppy fields in Afghanistan? you have to see before you understand the true nature of life in the United States.